uh, setting up for our next speaker, I'd like to just share a bit of information about the next speaker, Dr. Stuart Padoff. Uh, Dr. Stuart Padoff and I go back some probably close to 40 years uh, of working together, he's a great friend, great pulmonologist, also he's a sleep uh, medicine specialist. Uh, as you can see, his hair is a little bit white. I have no hair, uh, so that's probably the uh, general consensus. Uh, Dr. Padoff uh, has been with this conference uh, for many, many years, and uh, most of us know him. If you've been in uh, respiratory care or sleep medicine for any length of time, and so, uh, but. Once again, we want to welcome him uh, to the podium uh, for our next lecture. And without further ado, my dear friend and our great friend of the conference, Dr. Stuart Paddock. Last year at this time, Mel and I were prepared, well, actually a couple months uh, earlier, we were for the last year's conference, we were discussing doing sleep in COVID. And at that time I had reviewed the literature and thought that that would not be a easy topic to talk about. That really has not changed. Fortunately for me last year, Respironics had a recall, so we spent time talking about that. And maybe at the end of this conference, we will uh, ask some questions about who's got their new CPAP from res Respironics. But in any case, let's see here. Okay. So we're going to divide this uh, talk into four parts. First part is going to be a, clini a clinical vignette about my experience. We're going to talk about sleep recommendations from the sleep found uh, the National Sleep Foundation. And this is pretty standard stuff, even in COVID. And then we're going to move down to a population study. And I'll have to explain this one because it was sponsored by a mattress company. Yep. <laughs> and ResMed. And then the last one is I found two, two pretty good reviews of the literature on sleep and COVID, two good summaries. Also, there are two recent publications that are summary articles about sleep and COVID. One was from uh, Myra Krieger's new textbook of sleep medicine, probably the last one I will buy from him. He's retired and I'm retired and I'm not sure it's worth the, <laughs> the $200 on, uh, on eBay or on uh, 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 Amazon to get it, but it's a, it's a good read if you have, uh, if you need something to help you sleep at night. But he has a free chapter on COVID and it is uh, pretty, pretty nice. And then there's a uh, pre-publication on the national, uh, on the uh, sleep, clinical sleep medicine journal online that also discusses sleep and COVID. In addition, the national sleep meeting just occurred maybe three weeks ago and there are two uh, little abstracts I'm going to talk about. Okay, there we go. Now I'm catching it. All right. Well, this is our clinical vignette. I was visiting family out in, in the Southwest and had been there about three or four months and then COVID occurred. And so we had the big debate at my house. But I'd heard a little bit about uh, Wuhan, and I'd heard about uh, COVID very minimally at the beginning, other than somebody who will go, go nameless, who has a national prominence, said, well, this is just going to be like a bad flu season. Boy, was that an understatement. Uh, so some of the information we were getting was correct. Some of it was unreliable. Some of it was definitely incorrect. And by March, everything in Arizona had closed down, as had everything here in Alabama and the rest of the world. I was scheduled to fly back to Birmingham, and we had a big debate at my house whether it was safe to fly, and we decided to stay put. 
So for nine months, I lived in Arizona. And uh, it's an interesting experience. And when I say the duration, I wasn't expecting three years down the road for this to be, for us to still be dealing with this, but that's, what, what do I know? I'm not an expert. Uh, anyway, I had been retired for about 16 months. I had already set myself up to have a regular activity schedule, maintained it. Early on in COVID, I was staying up late, watching TV, reading, and getting up a little bit later, but finally settled on 10.30 to 11 p.m. as going to sleep and about 6.30 to 7 a.m. waking. The gyms were closed, so I would try a 20-minute walk twice a day, started exercising, didn't have any equipment per se, but managed to get a hold of some resistance uh, um, devices, plus uh, I did the third, number 34 UGA. Anyone know who I'm talking about? Heisman Trophy winner back in the 80s. Anyway, he didn't have a gym either, so he trained by doing uh, a, th a couple thousand push-ups and sit-ups a day. So I wasn't in that league, but I got up to about uh, 100 of each. And uh, obviously I didn't reach his level of dedication. <coughs> Try to keep mentally sharp, but we crossword puzzles, Sudoku, jigsaw puzzles, red mysteries, had Zoom game nights with family, started doing a little work on genealogy, and got about 90% of what I wanted to know off of Ancestry and Genie.com, had family reunions online, started doing a little more with my photography, and that's an out-of-focus blood moon from the fall of uh, 2021. But that's a blood moon. That's right before the harvest moon, in the uh, uh, moon cycle. And uh, it's out of focus. I got better with practice. And in the spring, the swarrow, the, the cactus come into bloom, and bees come swarming around it. And so I got fairly uh, competent at taking the picture. I wouldn't want to make a living on my photography, but <laughs> it's fun. Started streaming. And of course, all the shows were in hiatus, so we found a bunch of shows we hadn't seen, including Longmire, Friday Night Lights. We found a British uh, crime show that was pretty good, and we watched reruns of The Mentalist, among other shows. And I got a whole list. I can talk to you all about that after the conference if anyone's interested in my uh, TV playlist. But it kept us busy. I did some medical Zooms, I did some educational, general educational uh, Zooms. I did some religious Zooms, courtesy Mel. Uh, we would pick up groceries and household supplies, uh, ordering it online, use the internet for other needs. Uh, did have some outdoor activities with the people in the neighborhood. We were all masked. At that time, there was no uh, shots, no COVID vaccine. As I said, we streamed and binged what we did or what we were interested in. So I finally became fully vaccinated and boosted and we made our way back home to Birmingham after the temperature in Tucson hit 112 degrees. I said, enough, we gotta go. <laughs> so we returned in the uh, winter of uh, 2001, 2002. Things were kind of getting back to normal with the new quote norm. We celebrate family occasions and holidays, but we were masked. Finally, after two years of absence, we went up to see our brother, uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, who were fully vaccinated up in Phoenix. Lo and behold, three days after we got back, I got the phone call from my brother-in-law. And he says, I got COVID. And I said, oh my, my gosh. And a day later, I had a breakthrough COVID also. And it was like a very bad flu. And fortunately, I didn't have a need to be in the hospital or anything of that nature. I had headaches, sore throat, fevers, myalgias, cough, with or without sputum, high degree of anxiety with sleep disturbance, but I continued my auto CPAP. I did not sleep well. Symptoms overall lasted four or five days. COVID test remained positive for 10. 
I suffered from fatigue, this me a cough for about a month. The actual sleep disturbance was more like about a week or so after that, and I returned to my normal sleep pattern. So now we're going to talk about the National Sleep Foundation Sleep Guidelines. And this is sort of similar to what they published online before, which is, is there a way to get rid of this column? To just get rid of this for me. So we got to, so we can get the slides uh, being fully projected. And well, get this full screen. Well, the job. There, we there we go. Okay. Now that's better. Anyway, these were guidelines from the National Sleep Foundation. There has been a new term that has been called, uh, coined called Corona Somnia. And it's been described in the literature, basically have increased insomnia symptoms and disrupted sleep patterns after uh, onset of COVID. Adults more common than children have uh, problems with long COVID per, uh, who have persistent sleep issues. It's compounded by adjustment to uh, school closures, quarantine, working from home, and too little, too much sleep with loss of Zyke Keepers. Uh, Zyke Keepers are basically external signs that regulate our sleep-wake cycle. And if you suddenly don't have to go to work and you decide to stay up every night till 12 and 1 a.m., uh, you're going to have trouble when you try to start going back to sleep at 10 because you've lost your thigh keepers. You've been you've reset. Anyone who's had to take care of a, a family member at home or somebody else with COVID, they're going to not get good sleep. We're going to all get on the Internet and have excessive screen time. And that exposes us to blue light, which uh, dysregulates sleep. And the unfortunate thing is we've all become news junkies. And that's good news and bad news. We're, everyone's very aware of what's going on in the world of COVID. The problem is there's, you know, on the pay scale, I'm not the one that they're talking to at the NIH. I'm not the one who's making the, any decisions. So you have to get to go, go with the flow and not get yourself overly worried about COVID, which is obviously a very difficult thing to do. So all this obviously is going to lead to stress and discord in the house in many cases. That's not going to be conducive for sleep. Uh, and it's going to lead to headaches, memory lapses, digestive problems, fatigue, poor motivation and energy. People who have had COVID it, during this pandemic have had increased nightmares, vivid dreams, increased dream recall. Now, why is sleep important? I think we all know that we feel, uh, most of us feel a lot better when we've had a good night's sleep. Physiologically, it regulates the immune system and makes it more effective. It strengthens our defenses against all kinds of diseases. Lack of sleep can make some vaccines ineffective, usually the flu. I've not heard anything on the COVID vaccine, but um, would be, my guess is it would be the same. Good sleep makes us able to cope better, we can learn better, we can make decisions better. I'm sorry, I'm, this is not my usual way of uh, showing slides. Your mood will improve, your mental health will, will improve. Lack of sleep will worsen underlying mental issues. So their guidelines were, get a fixed wake up time. And that's been consistent with their prior guidelines. 
you're going to allow for wind down time at night. So for 30 minutes before you set sleep time, you need to sit there and just kind of relax, brush your teeth, wash your face, put your night clothes on or whatever, and just kind of get into that routine. We've talked about the consistent bedtime, you know, whether it be 1030 or 11, or if you work a, a different shift, you're going to have to make adjustments. But 1030 or 11 is uh, asleep. We're trying to go to sleep. You get up in the morning, and even if you don't have to go to work, you go through a routine of showering and get, getting dressed. No more sleeping, uh, no more staying in the night club, in your night clothes all day if you're not working. You're going to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the same time, according to them. And you're going to block off specific times for work, exercise, and daily tasks. The old uh, bedroom thing, make it uh, comfortable, only for sleep and sex. Working from home should not be working from bed. If you're tossing and turning, and this is the old, if you're not asleep within 20 minutes, you get up, you go out, the, out of the bedroom, you sit there, you turn the lights down until you get sleepy, and then you go back to bed. You don't toss and turn in bed. You don't want to have dirty bed sheets. Sounds like, I sound like, just like my grandmother. <laughs> you got to get those bed sheets changed at least every couple of days, fluff your pillows, make your bed fresh. Okay, you're going to optimize night exposure, the light exposure at night. So if you want to have natural light during the day, you want to get up in the morning and if necessary, walk outside and get that early morning exposure to bright light. Try to spend more time outside if you can. Open your windows and blinds, which is problematic in Alabama or Arizona. But, uh, definitely. <laughs> Watch the screen time. If you're going to take a nap, make it consistent and don't sleep, uh, don't take a nap for more than 20 minutes. So it will power nap. Get the regular exercise. If you read the news, look for positive stories. Look, look for people who are coping with this and the miracles that there are out there. Don't look at the one. On Sunday morning, they used to run this very sad, I don't know if you all know the trademark of this morning sun on Sunday on uh, Sunday morning on CBS and they used to run this very sad face with appropriate reasons with a running tally of the number of people who had passed away and that in itself just looking at that is very depressing so try to avoid negative stories only in, only look at the negative uh, stories when appropriate you try to stay connected and I didn't do as good, I did pretty good with uh, family, didn't do as well with friends, unfortunately, but pick up the phone, call your friend, Zoom with them, whatever, try to, to stay in touch. And in this case, use your electronic uh, technology to have a game night with your family uh, who's out of town or have uh, many family reunions online or just get together with your friends or in, in my case with, uh, uh, with um, Daryl and Mel, get together with them online. Okay, try to relax, and this is self-intuitive, but listen to music, meditate, yoga, new age kind of stuff, but I think it's appropriate in this case. Limited visits to, the, uh, to watching the news, don't turn on the mainstream media on TV and keep that TV on all the time because on that station. Don't do it. Try to, try to limit it to pertinent times. And again, this, be selective on your social media because there's a lot of bad stuff out there and misinformation. Healthy diet, that's intuitive. Alcohol disturbs sleep, so minimize that. We'll talk a little more about that. Caffeine should be limited to one or two cups of coffee in the morning, and certainly nothing beyond 2 p.m. in the afternoon, unless you're working late. Um, okay. If you have to see the doctor, 
during COVID, they recommend the tele, telemed if, uh, and only uh, see a face-to-face if that's absolutely necessary. If you're suffering from uh, insomnia, cognitive behavioral therapy for in, insomnia, and there are sites online that will walk you through that. Mindfulness therapy. Okay, COVID information. Notice one thing that's uh, lacking on this list. Anyone guess? Mainstream media. They're unreliable very, uh, for the most part. And that's not a political statement. That's, that's probably, uh, at least for this, they, they are not, they don't have it together. Check the WHO, the CDC. They're going to make mistakes because this is a new world for all of us. And today's truism is not going to be true tomorrow. And some of what I'm going to tell you today is probably uh, next year not going to be true. Or, or you may come to me afterwards and say to me, didn't you see that paper <laughs> about that not being true? But these are fairly reliable. Just be selective. Understand who you're listening to and, you know, look at it and try to confirm it in, at other sources if it really bothers you. Now, this is part three of this talk. And this is the mattress co company talk. ResMed and uh, I think it's uh, one of the mattress companies got together and formed, got a uh, sleep.com website. And ResMed has a product, which I won't name, but they've got an app that goes with that, that actually non-invasively measures your sleep by body movement and respiratory movement. And it, it's okay. It's, you know, it's not being in the sleep lab. It's not as accurate as that, but for purposes of doing population studies, it's wonderful. And they, uh, it's called Sleep Score, and it has been validated against intended, uh, attended polysomnograms. And they have 3.5 million likes, uh, nights of monitoring, 135,000 users, and I happen to be one of them for other reasons. Ages range from 18 to 20 to 75, so it's a broad spectrum. And it's non-contact, and they also found 2,700 individuals are willing to fill out uh, a sleep questionnaire for them and a survey. So they got a lot of data. It may not be 100% correct, but it's a lot of data. Now the criticism is a lot of the questionnaires depending on patient memory because they're asking them to compare their sleep before COVID to after COVID. And so it's, they're going to have trouble getting it published elsewhere, but they got it published online. And I'm sorry, uh, some of these slides do not, do not um, uh, project well. But this is a slide pre COVID. And, po and during COVID, about typical night sleep hours, and this is the percentage of responders. And as you can see, pre-COVID, um, a small percentage of people were getting less than five hours. After COVID, during COVID, it went up significantly. Now, five to uh, five to six hours was went down actually. Now, that means they were actually moving themselves over into the seven to eight hour area. That actually went down and then more than eight hours. There are some people who were long, became long sleepers. Again, this is, this is based on their monitoring of your body movements at night. Okay, time awake. We were in bed longer in many cases but we had longer awake times. More time awake while attempting to sleep. And if you look right here at the end, and again, I apologize. It looked better on my, uh, on my computer than it looks right up here. But basically, if you look at this, you can see everything, more time awake and longer time awake after COVID. 
How about how effective our sleep is? Are people getting up and saying, oh, I had a wonderful night's sleep? And that went, went down to more people were having bad nights sleeping. Even if they slept seven or eight hours, they just felt unrested. Okay. So, again, these were factors, activity during the day. I'm sorry, folks. I, I truly apologize. We're just going to move on. But anyway, take my word that uh, more people had trouble uh, uh, with sleepiness. Again, this, these are strategies that people use to try to get better, better sleep. Yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize. Anyway, am, I, am I okay back there now? Yes, I am. Okay. Basically, <coughs> estimated hours of sleep went up after COVID because people were staying at home. Some people had been laid off. Some people, uh, there was no place to go, so you, you slept later. Typical night, more people were sleeping longer. On an average, we would go to bed, uh, go to bed at 11.47, wake up at 7.30. And that was about 30 minutes longer sleep per night. Now, loneliness was a factor in COVID. If you got a good night's sleep, you felt better, you felt less lonely. So if you felt like your sleep was good, you had no days where you felt lonely. You felt like your sleep was bad. You had uh, more days of loneliness. Anxiety kept you up. The good news is the social jet lag got better. The people, you, you all understand what social jet lag is? Okay. Basically, Monday through Friday, you Go to bed maybe at 10, get up at, at 6 to get to work, or you get up at 6 to go to school or get the kids ready, whatever. And on the weekend, you'd stay up till midnight, 1 o'clock, partying, and sleep in till, uh, till 9 and 10 in the morning. That's social jet lag. Because people weren't getting out and doing things outside the house, it got better. And that was not unexpected. Okay, and so again, if you exercised, you did better with sleep. Okay, 81% of the people changed their diet. There was more snacking, particularly if you had kids in the house and you were taking care of the kids, you snacked. And it, and it was salty food and uh, high, high carb type of foods. As expected, alcohol sales went up, and that was attributed to, quote, stress and boredom, and I can understand both. Fortunately, unlike the uh, previous speaker, I was no longer working in the ICU, and I'm sitting there thinking, how would I have fared doing what he did, and it's remarkable what they achieved in the last two years, but anyway, that's an editorial comment. Factors adversely affecting sleep, excessive caffeine, alcohol, and heavy meals prior to bed. Okay. Uh, what happened here? Did we flip? What's going on? Oh, do you want to, are you trying to put the thumbnails? I'm trying, no, I'm trying to move the uh, slides. It looks like we got ahead and we got behind. We're getting there. Okay. Now I like to throw this in. This is one of those uh, presentations from the recent sleep uh, meeting. Anyone here use a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or anything to monitor their sleep? Yeah. Well, I do. And we can talk about my OCD <laughs> later. But anyway, they, they looked at uh, sleep data from uh, based on the uh, Fitbit app 
in six different uh, uh, localities. And they were the big cities that had been adversely affected by COVID. And again, this just correlates well with what the uh, sleep.com found. Increased sleep time, delay in bedtime, young uh, social jet lag improved. Uh, there's a way for them to kind of estimate your sleep stages with Fitbit. I'm not a believer in that, but uh, for in this case, for a large study, it probably works for an individual. <clears throat> but they had slow wave sleep that was unchanged. Rapid eye movement or dream sleep had increased slightly based on increased sleep time. And again, you were in bed more time, more, but uh, and sleeping less. Okay. And a large number of people, a minority of people, use trackers to track their sleep, and that increased pre and post COVID, or pre and during COVID. Okay. This is just a slide showing uh, worker school arrangements, and some people had work at home, hybrid work in person and other. But you can see hybrid from home increased during COVID. And you know, if you, if you got used to working at home and setting your own time, uh, it, it's probably hard to go back to going to, into work other than there's some social socialization that's done and there are some decisions made person to person. And also, uh, I think the hybrid's where we're going. All those empty offices, offices downtown. Okay. What you have to do, and this uh, study shows, is you got to separate your, your work activities from your sleep activities from your other activities. And if you did that always, you had a, an increased sleep quality by their measurement. Now this is a comment on society, and that is, I fared fairly well. I had a good place to stay, I had family around me, uh, I wasn't dependent on going into work for my, uh, uh, meeting my daily needs in terms of finances. And you compare that to people who were working hourly wage and how many places closed down during COVID, and you can understand why there was an increase in uh, in sleep problems among uh, the other privileged. And this slide just shows that pretty well. If you were white or Caucasian, you fared better than African American. You yeah, actually, if you were white or Asian, you fared better than Afri the African American community. Native Americans seem to fare fairly well. Now this, now we're going to get to the nitty gritty of an article published by Chakraverti. And I know you, those who have been to the, uh, to this, uh, conference before have, have heard me talk about Meyer Krieger and his textbook. Well, Chakraverti has the second, uh, textbook of sleep medicine and he's well thought of and he did a, he did a very nice article and it's open source. And what that means is you don't have to pay to get access to the article. So if you're interested, um, you go to this article here and it'll be on the handout later. And as we said, corda somnia or COVID somnia has a constellation of symptoms. Insomnia, disrupted sleep continuity, uh, ch a changing sleep wake cycle, non restorative sleep and decreased sleep quality. And that's been reflected in some of these slides I've shown you before. Okay, who's at risk for bad sleep during uh, COVID? Well, I think we all are, but more commonly it occurs in females. And it seems like in my practice, I had more female patients than male patients when I was practicing. Younger age group because they were still trying to work. People who have chronic psychiatric illness had more trouble with sleep during the uh, COVID. Chronic illness itself, unemployed, had problems sleeping. Lower educational status, 
and our friends from uh, mainstream media, insomnia, depression, all other forms of psychological stress increased. Insomnia was acute, but also was persistent. There were effects of COVID on obstructive apnea. You were predisposed to circadian rhythm disorders. You had excessive sleepiness during the day sometimes, and that was made worse if you had underlying uh, narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia. People with, post, uh, with uh, PTSD like symptoms had uh, sleep dysfunction. There was abnormal dreams. And that was particularly tr uh, true and uh, reported in people who streamed violent TV shows. They were more pre 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 predilected to have bad dreams at night. And there's one case of a transient restless leg syndrome associated with the insomnia and uh, COVID. This is a combination of several population studies that were performed early on uh, during COVID. And they are out of Italy, China, Greece, and Canada. And basically, they kind of confirmed what we've already talked about. Female gender, urban living, proximity to the ep epicenter. If you're in an urban center that has a lot of COVID patients, you're going to have more problems with your sleep. Lower education, lower uh, uh, socioeconomic status, psychiatric problems, poor coping techniques, no social support. I can't imagine living alone during COVID and having nobody to check in on you. And again, our friends mainstream media. Again, this exposes some of the problems we have in America, and it probably is almost universal, that uh, people who don't have the financial wherewithal do worse. They have more chronic care, chronic conditions, more health care problems, predisposed to heat, uh, to sleep deprivations, poor, poor immunity. If you're in lockdown, you're gonna have, this is going to compound to we were sort of in a self-enclosed lockdown when I was out in Arizona. We did not go outside other than to be with ourselves and walk the hood and all. And some people can, don't live in a safe area to walk. So if you're on lockdown, it's going to make uh, an older age female, uh, reduction in income due to being laid off, you have elderly dependents that you're trying to provide care for, you use alcohol, you're depressed already, and you have anxiety and stress, this is not going to make it better. Again, we've talked about some coping techniques, protective activities, such as listening to uh, music, taking up a new hobby, painting, all that. Now, in spite of that, some of the groups did have an increase in sleep time. But again, there was a report of worse quality. They slept longer, but they didn't enjoy, uh, find their sleep to be restful. College students in Italy had a phase delay. Phase delay is where every, the whole world's going to bed at 10 and waking up at 6, and you're going to bed at 1 or 2 in the morning and sleeping through the 9 or 10. That's a phase delay. You're still getting adequate amount of sleep, you're just having it at a different time of day. That guy actually got better in Italy after a while. Dutch study, some of the people who had insomnia before COVID got better, others who classified themselves as good sleepers had the uh, trouble of worse sleep, worse than sleep. Again, we talked about the use of electronic devices that keep you up, social media, whole same thing. Okay, so general message, uh, the general message here is that there are things that were done that were effective, and that is the vaccine. And I can tell you, I had breakthrough, and I was sick and miserable. 
but it wasn't like you know, having the full-blown unvaccinated. Yeah, I probably would have ended up because of underlying medical problems, at least being in the ER and maybe in the hospital. So I'll put in I'll put in my endorsement of vaccinations, even though there are problems there. PPEs early on. They were telling you, well, you don't need masks. And I know why they were telling you that, uh, to, telling the general public that, because they needed the PPEs and the masks for those of us who were in healthcare and trying to render care. A uh, little white lie there. Social distancing is obvious. I don't know. You go, you go now and still people are staying six feet apart, uh, approximately. Nobody's breathing down your neck in the line anymore. You want to get those comorbidities under control. These were the uh, therapies that were used. Uh, supportive measures were covered earlier. And he covered a lot more detail than I'll ever know or understand. Specific measures that you have to do. If you have an acute insomnia, normally I don't recommend sleeping pills. In this case, they may be necessary. CBI is still hard to get. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, still not widely available. Melatonin is definitely controversial, but there are some studies that say it helps uh, patients in the ICU sleep and less dementia. And he, talk, he talked about the positive airway pressure of OSI and the uh, precautions for an aerosolization, which have actually gotten better. In this room, we either fall, most of us either, not me, but most of us fall under healthcare worker or frontline healthcare worker. And these were the uh, uh, problems that we came in contact uh, had to deal with. That for all of us who are in the healthcare field, we have an increased risk of developing COVID. We were seeing larger volumes of patients who were sick. We were pulling additional shifts, longer hours. We were suffering from burnout, mood disorders, sleep dysfunction. There was inadequate uh, PPE and hand washing available. And we had a lot more unprotected exposures. The front line, it was worse. They were doing assessment of patients. They were seeing patients in quarantine, in isolation, and treating patients behind that glass wall, or glass door. It's hard not to develop a fear of disorder when you see a young person with their lungs full of fluid. You're, gonna, you know, you're looking at him or her, and then you're thinking about yourself and your family. Brings me to tears when I think about it. You're going to have nightmares, frontline probably, more PTSD either from previous life's experience or develop it. Your total sleep is going to get less. You're going to have to use sleep aids. And this may outlast your exposures. We may have to deal with the psychological symptoms. Again, females more likely to have a problem. Again, that may reflect the workforce with uh, more nurses still being feet uh, and healthcare workers still being female. We all age, we all get chronic medical problems. We can't get a midday nap, or we take a midday nap and it's destructive to our nighttime sleep. Night shifts are a problem. There's a lack of, at least early on, lack of professional support because it just wasn't the mechanism to get that to y'all. Negative experiences in the unit or you know, some doctor getting short-tempered with y'all because he's on, he or she is under stress and she takes, they take it out on you guys. And it's terrible, but it happens, unfortunately. The fear that we develop and the stress that we have to deal with. So as time developed, uh, we did reduce the risk of infection by improved hand hygiene and, and PPEs. They were able to change shifts, uh, 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 staffing shifts, and then the institutions came forward and started to do some more support for y'all. Lockdowns, I think they decided at the end of the day, lockdowns were probably not good for people, 
patience or the economy. Uh, but people had to uh, had to adjust to unlock, un unemployment, working from home, taking if you're a student taking online classes. And actually, the I can tell you that the elementary students, my grandchildren, they did fine with it. Once, once they got into it, they were great. <laughs> but I can imagine if you're a college student and used to being at a class and talking to uh, and interacting with the professors, great, uh, it's a little bit more difficult. Now, the good thing was for some people, elimination of that commute was great, and that's why a lot of people like the hybrid or work from, working from home. Uh, it, you know, going from uh, from Mount Brook to to West End Baptist to Princeton or out to UAB West was a thirty to forty five minute drive for me daily when I was practicing medicine. But doing telemedicine was eliminated that for me. Okay, so we're not going to talk about this because I think it's redundant. I'm not going to talk about this because it says the same thing we've said before. And then we've talked about shift workers. We have not talked about shift workers, but for them, more of them have increased risk of cancer, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and diabetes working that night shift. That has resulted in increased COVID risk to them, sleep deprivation, diminished immunologic responses, Disrupted circadian rhythm, which feeds back and makes those immune responses less effective, and inhibited melatonin secretion. And that increases uh, the risk of uh, herpes and influenza and increased risk of COVID. Again, women, poor sleep hygiene, urban women, this is the general population. Very similar, but not quite the uh, the numbers that uh, healthcare workers had. Lockdown made uh, problems worse in terms of income, increased alcohol use, increased mood, mood disorders, weight gain, and increased use of the electronic media. Shift workers, uh, same thing. Okay, if you get hospitalized with COVID, the, de uh, the deal is going to be you're going to get worse sleep with the duration of hospitalization. Anyone had an overnight hospitalization? Anyone had several days in, in this room in the hospital? Did you sleep well? No. <laughs> Personal experience speaking. And you'll have some changes in your lymphocyte. Now, what's the problem with long haulers? We'll talk a little more. This is all speculative, but uh, they probably have an increased viral load. They have an increased cytokine activation. The angiotensin and uh, virulent enzyme density was probably increased, and that may be an issue. That's controversial. They had more mitochondrial cellular dysfunction, more oxidative dis uh, stress. Now, this is the one case of restless legs I can find. And it's uncertain whether this was related to uh, COVID, but didn't have it before, had it while she had COVID, and got better. One case, for what that's worth. Okay, OSA. Mechan uh, again, you have mechanical narrowing of the, uh, of the upper airway with collapse during sleep, uh, intermittent desaturations, Persistent hypoxemia arouses from sleep and sympathetic hyperactivity in OSA. Untreated apnea is associated with these predisposing diseases that make it more likely for you to get COVID. Obesity, COPD, asthma are risk factors not only for OSA but for COVID-19. So it's hard to separate out what's OSA and what's COVID-19. Common mechanisms are here. We've talked about that. Again, uh, pro-inflammatory sleep deprivation, sleep fragmentation with intermittent hypoxemia, uh, less of a response to septic and viral inflammatory exposure. The pro-inflammation leads to pulmonary infiltration, 
respiratory distress, death, and the up regulation of ACE2 receptors basically facilitate the COVID-2 virus entry into the system. So they have a lot of common uh, factors there between OSA and uh, COVID-19. I think the go, uh, go away from this is untreated OSA patients, that somebody who's not on a CPAP, have an increased risk of getting COVID. Now, it's not sure whether CPAP is protective. My guess is it probably is. This was a practice in New York City that checked on their patients already on uh, CPAP. And the walk away was most patients wanted to stay on their CPAP. Now, whether it was protective or not, it's good. that's going to be a study down the road. Most patients uh, were more compliant, as a matter of fact, to, to CPAP. So now, how did the sleep practices cope? And I'm doing this as an observer, not as somebody who's practicing sleep does. And I'll tell you that I would have done a lot of things differently than I've been doing for 20 years in sleep does. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was going to a clinic up in North, uh, Northwest Alabama. And again, it was like an hour and a half. It was the longest hour and a half ride going and coming back. And I went to Blue Cross and said, hey, how about we set up a telemedicine clinic in an underserved area? Their answer at that time was, no, we don't think that would be advisable. And we're not going to pay you for that. And I said, okay, forget that good idea. They changed their tune. <laughs> and uh, telemedicine is here whether it's going to uh, stay as prevalent now as uh, uh, after uh, COVID, I don't know. But I got a feeling it will. Uh, the ASSL, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, did publish a position paper. And it basically says, must fair, uh, mirror face-to-face. -face. So generally you have to do the same things that you would do if you had a face-to-face. -face. Obviously there are limitations. There are ways to listen to the heart and the lungs. Uh, but and not, you know, not universally available. You have to comply with uh, licensing. And the state uh, medical board said, you know, they, they thought that would be a good idea 10 years ago because of the underserved areas. But uh, with Blue Cross not going along with it at that time, nothing you can do about it. It has to be HIPAA compliant. You have to have safety considerations. Uh, you, obviously, you can't do a telemedicine visit while you're driving your car down to a not, not going to happen. And if the patient is on CPAP, you need to do more intensive compliance downloads. And even the auto CPAP may need to have uh, some fine tuning. We know that some labs, uh, I, I tried to do a survey of the labs here in town, and I'm yesterday's news. I couldn't get any good information or reliable information. But in the rest of the country, some labs were temporarily, temporarily closed as they found trying to figure out how to handle this. As we know, if you work in the sleep lab, social distancing is impossible if you're hooking up a patient. I mean, you can't use PPEs and all that, but uh, uh, you're going to touch, you're going to be close, you're going to be certainly closer than six feet. CPAP titration runs the risk of aerosolization, so it sounds like that's less of a risk than we initially thought. There are a limited number of studies. The use of uh, out of center sleep testing, that's O S O C S T and home sleep non-attended studies accelerated. And you know, the CDC had some recommendations about cleaning equipment. ASSM basically said follow uh, keep your uh, let your uh, devices rest for 72 hours to get rid of uh, the COVID diet. So COVID diet. Yeah. COVID diet. <laughs> virus and disposable uh, peripheral arterial tonography came into place. And I, w I was already doing this, but uh, I tried not to do self-titrating uh, the lab. Uh, the insurance companies got to the point where they, uh, they were questioning the need. So most of my patients went out on auto CPAP and that's the way everyone else moved.
You're going to have to use questionnaires. You're going to have to do a lot of subjective uh, evaluations to see if what you're doing is working. Actigraphy may be necessary uh, for sleep wake rhythms. Attended PSGs will continue. They are, they are still necessary versus home sleep testing. If you've got somebody who you think has got narcolepsy, home sleep testing won't, won't help you there. And remote adherence. Okay, so this was a headline. And this is what frustrates me about mainstream media. This is actually a medical book, Medscape. And the, uh, uh, Megan there, uh, puts this thing, alarming new data on, this, uh, on disordered sleep after COVID. And this was stuff that we already kind of knew, but it's now been, it's now in an abstract form. And there were 962 Cleveland Clinic uh, patients who had uh, post-COVID uh, long syndrome. 67% still reported fatigue, 21% had severe fatigue, 41% had moderate sleep disruptions. 8% had severe sleep disruptions. Blacks, after adjustment for demographics, demographics had a threefold higher odds of moderate to severe sleep issues. COVID patients have more trouble sleeping afterwards. And that's hospitalized and severe COVID patients. So that's the walk away is we're in the infancy of what we know about sleep disorders and COVID. And I'm certain we're going to find down the road evidence that the virus has affected sleep structures, such as the uh, hypothesial uh, and the uh, CSN and our sleep wake centers. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to find that. Right now, there, there is no uh, pathologic evidence, but we're going to find it. Because the, the way the uh, Virus enters it through the nasal passages, and they have access to the brain, and it's bound to do some change in there. So, with that, I have one question for y'all. Anyone in this room got their new CPAP from Respironics? The one, yay, two, okay. Well, they are putting them out there. That's just a, that's just for my information. I still haven't gotten mine, but I went, I went over to the other guy to resume it. <laughs> Uh, last year, but uh, in any case, I'm open to questions. We've got about five minutes. Be glad to try to handle them. If not, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. And I'm sorry that the slides some didn't project. I had, I had to copy some slides off of the off of the internet, and it just didn't project like I thought it would. At home in my home office, it looked good. But the, the, the walk away, is, yes, sir. How did you handle the withdrawal of the Phillips CPAP machines? What, what? Well, I was out, fortunately or unfortunately, I was out of practice, but the first thing I did myself was to call one of my contacts, one of the vendors in town. Uh, well, the first thing I did was talk to my Respironics friends, and they were doing the company line. But uh, then I decided that there was enough evidence to go on and try to get a, a new machine. A lot of my, I, I talked to a patient of mine that uh, is using his restaurant's device with a filter, and he's on the list to get a new one, and he's been trying to find uh, companies to supply it with one. So anyone wants to have a CPAP uh, company, wants to talk to me afterwards, I can give you his name. It probably is a non-HIPAA. I can give him your name as a non-HIPAA violation. Um, but that, you know, if I had been in practice, uh, you see this gray hair? It would have been gone. It would have been like now. <laughs> None left uh, with the phone calls, I'm certain. And uh, uh, they say they're going to have the machines out by the end of the year. I've heard that before. Uh, but in, in any case, again, it is what it is. All right, folks. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure again. <laughs>